Ray, you're in a remarkable position, having studied neuroscience, have been a doctor for many decades, uh, worked in neurology with patients, a great writer, philosopher, uh, uh, appreciating art and aesthetics. When you look at science, how much of ultimate truth can science ultimately get to? Not where we are today, but ultimately. What yeah. are the limits of science? Yeah. I mean, I'm going to preface my remarks by saying I think science is the greatest intellectual monument of humanity. I think it's probably one of the greatest, it's probably our greatest cultural achievement collectively. Having said that, I think there are limits that are always going to be present. First of all, science cannot dig beneath itself to explain why there is such a thing as knowledge and more generally why there is such a thing as consciousness. In other words, it cannot actually uh, find its own foundations. Secondly, its whole approach is third person, objective, quantitative, and therefore there will invariably slip through its grasp the immediate first person experiences that lie at the center of our lives. And thirdly, I think it will always fail in relation to the fundamental metaphysical questions, most notably why there is something rather than nothing. The current attempts by M theory and all that sort of stuff to explain why there's something rather than nothing seem to me rather like uh, Tommy Cooper with his conjuring tricks, just like that, you know. And I don't think I'm persuaded that they have anything like an explanation, nor will we ever arrive at an explanation. Science stands on the assumption that there is something and then moves on. Okay, uh, let's, let's examine some of those. Um, in terms of the first person versus the third person, many scientists would say that that's our contribution to eliminate the first person because mm -hmm. the first person um, is deceptive. Some would say it's even illusion. Some would want to eliminate it because it, it, it distorts our understanding that only when you deal in the third person can you really uh, approach objective truth. Mm. Well, that's by definition true. I mean, objective truth is going to be third person. Uh, the question is whether objective truth is the sum total of truth. Yes. And my own feeling is there is subjective truth as well. For example, my experience of lying on a beach on a warm day is a reality that cannot be, as it were, dismissed as an illusion by science, even though we know that warmth boils down to atoms jigging up and down in certain ways. And my experience of the warmth uh, boils down, possibly, according to some people, uh, of sodium ions going through semi-permeable membranes, up my neurons, and so on and so forth. But it, 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 there is no way you can say, I'm not experiencing, this experience is an illusion. Okay, but, but it, that experience has to be expressed, and, and it's expressed, and we can describe all of your feelings in terms of physical activities. We can't do it today, all of it, to do it, but eventually we can. I mean, that's the argument, that the, the first person um, is, uh, is, is not a reflection of reality. It's, a, it's something that is like the foam on, on, on top of the waters. It's floating on top of the reality, but it's not the substance beneath it, and ultimately we can explain it in terms of the, of the third person objective reality. But let's look at the kind of things that Galileo and after him Locke set aside as, as it were, so-called secondary qualities that seemed ontologically a bit shabby compared to the kind of things that science, quantitative science looks like. Like color, like the sense of warmth, like smell and so on. It seems to me one will never ever get to the position of demonstrating that those really aren't what they are. Of course, we may find reasons for them. We may find uh, some underlying mechanisms by which they may be brought about. But in the end, the phenomena cannot be dismissed. Okay, so I think what we're, we're, we're saying is that all of these can be subsumed under the, under the general concept of, of uh, subjectivity or consciousness or mind. So I think that's one category that we're saying that science, you're saying that science won't have total access to. More broadly, the phenomenal world. Okay, the phenomenal yeah. world, very good. Um, let's try to explore something else. Why is there something rather than nothing? The physics theories today uh, would uh, show how uh, something comes from nothing, but the problem is there nothing is the laws of physics. So you have uh, uh, quantum fluctuations, and in a, in, in, a, in a nothing that has quantum fluctuations, you can have 
a universe pop into existence. Now, how that works may or may not be true, but in any event, the, the most uh, fundamental of the scientists still have to have those laws of physics. So I think the second area that we're saying that, that, that physics uh, uh, and science cannot get to, because they, they have to start with some fundamental laws. Indeed, they have to start with some fundamental stuff. I mean, uh, I think that the, the position is worse than you've described. I mean, you've, what, what is the quantum fluctu fluctuations in a vacuum? Is it fluctuations of nothing? How can nothing fluctuate? How, how, in what way does it fluctuate? They can describe it mathematically, of course, but actually the notion of nothing fluctuating is a notion that we mustn't allow to go by on the nod. And also the idea that actually creation didn't cost anything because there was as much antimatter yeah. as matter was produced, so the net productivity was... You know, you get two free lunches which are in opposite directions out of nothing. I can't believe that anybody entertains that for more than the, you know, the life expectancy of a pi muon. It <laughs> is so ridiculous that suddenly a negative and a positive come out of nothing. That it differentiates itself into two opposite kinds of material, and that's how you get your big free lunch. So we have the phenomenal world and we have the existence of the physical universe as two things that are outside the purview of science. Is there anything else? That's big enough. It always reminds me of a character in Beckett who says there's two things you couldn't stand. One was the earth and the other was the heavens. But otherwise, you, you know, you're feeling easy about it. It seems to me that excludes quite a lot. Yes, it does. The it phenomenal does. world, first person being, yes. on the one hand, and uh, as it were, those things that are a proper study, perhaps, of theology or metaphysics on the other. Yeah. So these are, I'm happy then within that for science. There's a third thing, of course, which probably comes from the phenomenal world, is secondary, which is that of values. I mean, clearly, science can tell you how to get to a particular goal, but not tell you whether a good whether it's a good goal or an appropriate one. It's a fantastic vehicle for taking you from your intentions to their realization, uh, but it doesn't tell you whether those are good intentions or indeed why you ever intended to do those things.